Let's hope everything goes well. Okay. Hmm. There is, I think, an LED. Oh yeah, it's This LED is going. It's very faint though. What the heck? Now this says pin one, and I'm thinking, oh, jumper. No, actually, actually, it's. I don't know if you can see that, but it says pin one right there. I wonder if that's referring to the pin one of the ribbon cable, in which case this is actually backwards. I fit it into here based upon the notch of of the cable. Of course. Uh, you know, the, the socket here for this ribbon cable has an, an empty notch and it's an actual socket that has a plastic rim around it and then there's a cutaway, you know, if you're familiar with these kind of ribbon cables. So there's only one way that ribbon cable will go in there. Now does it tell me what where pin one is here? I don't really see, but I guess I can try reversing this. Pretty sure I've reversed IDE cables before without incident. Let's try. Yeah, I don't have any activity on the LED at all now. And there's no video, um, which is odd. I got the clicking on the, on the floppy drive, but I've got no video. And I take it that this was the right way around based upon the fact that I was at least getting a, 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 a um, activity LED and yeah it kind of looks like pin one here is supposed to be on this side I think I'm gonna have to look up a picture of somebody else's setup to make sure that this is in the right orientation it was shipped to me like this with pin one on this side I'm not even sure if this this compact flash is good you know it's obviously it looks like it's got some wear on it. I don't think you can set this to master. I think you have to keep it on master either way. If I remember correctly, um, if you put this in an IDE chain and it's the second one, you're going to have to... Uh, that's when you would put it on slave. Otherwise, if it's a single device on, on an IDE chain, it's going to be always master. Otherwise, it will never work. Um, and maybe just what this is. I don't know, Amiga Sys for AGA. I mean, maybe that's just the second hard drive that's set up on this card, you know, whatever. Um, I guess I could probably test this card with WinUAE. Um, add it as a bootable drive. Um, Amiga 1200, maybe I can get it to boot off of it or at least see it. Uh, but yeah, let me go do some research on this. You know, I did have the uh, an original, well, not an original, but there was a, I have a compact flash card here that would work with my Terrible Fire 330, which is the CD32 version of this. Just going to give that a try. I mean, we should get something, you know? Actually, if I have a floppy plugged in there, it's probably going to take precedence, right? 
So it's very dim, this LED, but it's solid. That's interesting. That LED was actually flashing along with the sound of the GoTech. So, geez, I wonder if I should load Workbench. Let's, uh, let's put Workbench in. Workbench 1.3. Who knows if that's even going to work to see the drive. I was going to say, if I received a package and it's, everything's working, that would, be a, uh, that would be a small miracle. You know, when this Amiga 500 came in, it was, it was actually a fully functional. Thing on this disc that's going to help me. A workbench 3.1 might be helpful, but I mean this thing should just boot. I don't know what's going on. I went on the internet to try to figure out if I had the orientation correct, and nobody seems to be using this compact flash card with the ribbon cable. There's some kind of right angle one without the ribbon cable. So yeah, I think this um, compact flash adapter was reversed because uh, it was around this way, pretty sure. And it needs to go this way. Pin 1 needs to be over here on the red stripe, and this is pin 1 of the connector. Either that or pin, both pin 1s are over here. But either way, um, I'm pretty sure, because I, I, this is my uh, CD32 compact flash adapter, and it had, um, I had already marked a 1 over here, um, so it, it's lining up with the red stripe on my CD32. So I think, I think we can assume this is all pin 1 on this side of this circuit board and this side of the terrible fire 536. Uh, because if you reverse it, the light is dim. But if you put it this way, it gets it's bright. And what's weird is when it's reversed and the light is dim, the light uh, the computer hangs for you know several seconds and then and then it begins to boot off the floppy and you can actually see the activity on the dim light of the floppy. So you know, signals across, whatever. Oh, well, wait a minute. I, one thing I need to do is disconnect the uh, floppy, right? Forgot to do that. <laughs> so that would keep it from booting off the hard drive because floppy is given the priority. So I'm looking, I'm looking. Oh yes, perfect. We have activity. I think we're loading. Let's find out what's on this. Uh... Okay, wait. What just happened? Did we spontaneously reboot? I think we did. The one thing about this board, um, and I'm hoping it's normal, is that when it first starts up, it gives like a um, rainbow screen thing. Um, it's still booting. We're still we got activity on the on the compact flash. The lights flashing. Um, the one thing that might be screwing us up, oh no, we're sort of good. Yeah, I, I was going to say the one thing that's probably screwing us up is this card might be an AGA, uh, set up for an AGA screen mode. Uh, however, um, my scan doubler is a scan doubler. It is only going to double 15 kilohertz. So if if this is feeding my scan doubler um, productivity mode, like the 24 kilohertz modes, it's not going to display properly. So, um, but we we have a working Amiga. So what I can do is I can put in the compact flash. I'm fairly excited about this working now. Now that I got it sorted out. 
we still have to try his compact flash adapter because I did test this with his. Okay, so I'm putting my compact flash in here that has the CD32 operating system and it of course is only going to boot into you know the video chip in the CD32 doesn't have the productivity modes that the 1200 does you know because it's designed only to, to display I mean the CD32 only comes with a composite out that's it it's a TV uh, desktop you know uh, what do you call it set top box or whatever so wait a minute it's doing the same thing so what do you think is going on there? Is it possible? Oh, I just changed this stupid input, damn it. Yeah, of course. Uh, I don't know what mode I'm in, but it must be composite. Let's see here. No. We're just going to um, reset a couple things. Yeah. See? Yeah, so we're booting a F Amiga 500 with a Terrible Fire 536 in it, which doesn't surprise me that it has an error here. Um, but yeah. That was weird. So my. Scan doubler needed to resync, I guess, to the thing. All right. Well, anyway. Um, so 804k chip, 63.9 megabytes of fast. Uh, yeah. So I'm really happy about this. Let's uh, let's try Brad's compact flash. And um, now that we got the screen sorted out, we're trying his compact flash card in my adapter. And we're just going to see what might be hidden on this uh, compact flash. This only Amiga makes a possible compact flash. Supposedly Amiga OS 3.1. Okay, that's weird. So yeah, it just, that's what it does when you first turn it on. And it just did it again. So, um, I don't know what's going on, but uh, sometimes the... Amiga doesn't like what it's reading on the card. Anyway, uh, I don't know if I'll continue with, you know, the exploration of this compact flash. It seemed like you would do something, uh, it would be something you'd want to do in another video. But, um, but yeah, we have a working everything. So let me grab my camera, on my phone that is, not the one I'm filming with, and um, take a picture of the whole thing so I can send it to Brad. He'll be very happy about that. We can plan for him to come visit. So what we haven't done is we haven't tried Brad's compact flash adapter with this. We've already tried this, so I, I almost am... With, it would be most logical to assume that this compact flash adapter is bad. Um, but maybe in my process before of trying to get this to work, I flubbed. I did a flub. Let's just find out. Okay. So there's nothing wrong with Brad's compact flash adapter except the LED doesn't work. Yeah, no, I get no activity on the LED. So I had assumed, and the back, basically also the fact that the screen, I had assumed that it didn't work because the LED was not working, which is, I mean, you depend on that for knowing if things work or not. Let's see here. Speed. Okay, so according to this, my 9196, I'm faster than an A3000, twice as fast. And, uh, you know, we got the O30, 51 megahertz. Yeah. So, get the 64 megs of 
fast RAM, the one mega chip RAM, nothing else. Yeah, so I think that's pretty good. There's something probably not only, well, it's 16 colors, that shouldn't be a killer, but I bet you there's something running in the background here that is really killing the display. Something that's making this, you know, like magic work. Oh, look at that. Did you see that? It's got, yeah, it's got a software that's automatically switching focus. So yeah, it's got like a, you know, who knows what it's got, a magic workbench or something. Something like that, some kind of mod for, yeah. <laughs> Heavily modified, shall we say. It's just pig slow, though. I'm going to let Brad uh, uh, deal with that. I mean, uh, he'll probably just want to make his own compact flash anyway. Load his own stuff onto it, you know. That's what everybody does. But, you know, everybody has their own idea, and none of them are right or wrong. Uh, it's just, this isn't what I would have chosen. I never used Magic Workbench or any other utilities to make Workbench pretty because I was kind of focused on uh, productivity and getting things done or or just not even booting in Workbench, booting straight into a, a floppy game or something. I didn't really have anything in between that I was interested in. Um, I think what we're going to do is we're going to add an LED to this. Now the question is, all right, so let's say we had this thing on here, right? Um, so the easiest way to mount it is to just kind of fold this over and you know, maybe glue it to the thing, or it'll probably just stay there if you just like stick it there because of the tension of this ribbon cable. Um, and then if you did that, would you be able to see the LED? No, you wouldn't be able to see the LED. So if you rotated it like this, I believe you would. You would be able to see the LED through the case. So I think. Uh, I think if we just put a different LED in there, maybe one that, uh, you know, maybe a little bit bigger of one rather than an SMD, just put something bigger in there and um, just take a larger LED and like glue it sideways here and, you know, because uh, it'll rip the pads right off if somebody bumps it, you know, it's not an SMD LED. I don't have any SMD LEDs. Plus, we could do with a little more brightness in there, and uh, I don't think it would be a problem to uh, to run a larger LED off of that circuit. You know, I've done that sort of thing before; never had a problem. Um, anyway, yeah, let me do that real quick, and then so that when we we're going to do this with the cable, and then when it's in there, you should be able to see the activity through the cooling fins of the Amiga. Now here's something strange. I'm, I found out which one is the plus and the minus for the LED. Um, but what's weird is it's a constant, um, I don't know if you can see that it's a reflection, it's a constant 5 volts. 4.8 volts. Even when there's no activity. So does it require the draw of an LED before it starts modulating? Uh, it's kind of strange. Well, I know which way to solder the LED on. I just thought that was kind of weird. Let's see if it works. Okay, we got an LED on there now. Uh, let's see how well it works. I think we messed something up. So unless my LED just suddenly uh, popped off, I think uh, it wasn't the LED that had the problem, it was the circuit. Some part of a trace or something it went to the LED because it's not lighting up at all.
Got five volts on the uh, on that, and then if we go to uh, if we go to ohms, test the other side. We should have. Oh, that's interesting. Yeah, there's something goofy. Like maybe this is supposed to have a bias voltage of five. And it's the it's the lower voltage that's not coming through. I I guess so in other words, this this is basically bias voltage means that when something's at rest, it's not being active, it actually has voltage running, it actually has a voltage on it. And then in order for it to become active, a lesser voltage or even sometimes a negative voltage is put uh, uh, to the to the what would be the cathode side of it to make it turn on. Um, there's reasons to do that, I don't want to get into why they would do that, but maybe that's how these LEDs work and, and whatever, for whatever reason the um, you know, pulling down voltage on its cathode side is not working because it works when I, uh, yeah, there's something wrong with the circuit in here. I don't know if it, it could even just be a bad pin somewhere, but I would actually think that maybe if it's being switched on with one of these little transistors or something, that it's bad, but it's not the LED that's bad, it's the circuit. There's some part of the circuit that's bad. So, we'll just do something benign to this um, to keep it in its place. The O30 chip needs to, you know, shouldn't really set it on top of it or anything like that. Just need to put something on the back of this to make sure it doesn't the pins don't come into contact with otherwise it would almost stay there itself you could almost glue these two connectors but but with like a butt joint together I'm gonna resist the temptation of using double-sided tape it, uh, I, I could and I might, but I'll, I'll only put it on the bottom of this. I won't actually tape this to the terrible fire accelerator. Because when it comes to changing this card out, if you wanted to, we don't want to make it that difficult. Let me see what I have. So I just have one side of uh, hook and loop. You know, the fuzzy side. It's non-conductive. Basically, what we're all we're doing is we're we're putting a spacer in there, and because this I have experience with this particular roll of stuff, the glue is just so stupid it does not stay. I'm just gonna put some super glue on there. What do you do when you're gonna make it permanent? Well, this is compact flash isn't really working anyway properly, so. There we go. I think that's pretty good. So we're pretty safe here, like this. Granted, it is going to move around in here a little bit, but uh, we'll come loose and start wiggling around. We don't want that. I have to figure out something to keep it in place without messing with the terrible fire board. Okay, so what I've come up with here is a semi-permanent, completely reversible, benign. Um, we're safe. We're not touching anything, I don't believe. I think we're okay. Let's take a good look from this end. Yeah, we're not touching anything. It's 
not too messy. I mean, zip ties are, are never the neatest option. But, um, yeah. the frickin' hell? Have you ever seen this before? It's a female to compact flash. Who? What? I guess you would use this to plug straight into a laptop or something? I can't believe I ordered the wrong one. I didn't even know these things existed. So I got something in the mail. Here's the dumb one that I mistakenly ordered. And here's the actual one that we need. It's to have mail pins on it, John. Okay, just turning it off. All right, so uh, let's uh, let's see here. Okay, um, yeah. So let's. Uh, Let's try that. Well, that's lovely. Did I put it in wrong? What did I do? It's not putting up. Just a solid light? Hmm. Remember how I bought the wrong gender? I decided I could probably test it this way. Um, you know, I want to know what my options are. I'm pretty sure the new one I bought that's, that's the right one is broken. But let's see. This is actually designed to do this kind of, um, you know, on a laptop or whatever. So we may have the same problem here with this one. Okay, so apparently from what I gather, and correct me in the comments if I'm wrong, but there isn't a lot of information on the Terrible Fire 536, especially in regards to compact flash adapters, but from what I gathered, some compact flash adapters are not, don't work with it, and sometimes you can remove the transistors, and I tried that, I tried to remove the transistors off of this one, you know, the circuit that operates the LED. What's weird is the compact flash adapter that I have in my, in my CD32 with the Terrible Fire, that works fine. Um, <clears throat> The one that came with this one works fine, but it doesn't have an LED, and it seems like somehow the LED circuit, this one here, seems like the LED circuit has somehow been disabled. Um, and of course the new one, the, the one that I bought, is just doesn't work at all, and even if I, you know, like I said, even if I removed the circuit for the LED, uh, <clears throat> it still doesn't work. It's just a solid, uh, solid LED no access, it immediately goes to, to the kickstart image, it doesn't even, it's just basically it thinks that there's no hard drive there at all, it doesn't even try.
you know, I'm not, I'm not going to uh, buy a bunch of compact flash adapters and charge my friend for them or whatever. Um, so basically, I mean, this is working. It just, it just doesn't have a hard drive activity. Uh, so I think we're going to call this done. Um, you know, so let's, uh, let's put this all back together. Just make sure it works one more time. problems. I don't think we have any problems. All right, so this switch is a problem because it's actually sticking up above the case. And when you go to flip the case over to put the screws in, it's only held in there with hot melt glue. We don't want to do something too you don't want to like epoxy it in there or something. And plus what it's glued to could break, you know, you never know. So I'm going to take a Dremel and shave down this, this top post real quick of that. You can see what I'm talking about. There's no reason for that not to be flush. We may as well make that flush with the top of the uh, Amiga. He'll be able to reach in there. I mean, there's a big old space. I'm going to put... Um, a label across here maybe to cover up the other hole or something I, I don't know I'll figure it out I guess it's right here. and so this switch is now flush with the top so I can comfortably flip it over so me or is this thing getting heavier The only other thing I think that Brad might want to do to this uh, computer is, oh look at that, it looks like an Amiga 500, but it's, it's got a secret. Um, what Brad might want to do is get a Super Denise. It's kind of handy to have around, I would think. So I think we're in, let's put it in 1.3, and let's boot off our uh, disk. I don't know which one of these works but I want something different yeah what he might want to do is upgrade to a Super Denise he's gonna to have to take the accelerator out to fit it in there I think but, uh, so we're booting off a floppy we're on 1.3 so we should be good I guess that's a good way to test we're on 1.3 we're gonna to try to load 3.1 um, What's wrong here? Something's not Something's not kosher there. Loose wire or something I guess Only problem is I don't get to see an activity LED, so it's like you wait, you wait, you wait, you hope, you hope that everything's working. You don't really know. Y'all are gonna love this. It's booting up now. You want to know something? This, these last two pins, short against the the back of the keyboard. I mean, hello? I mean, I, granted, I don't understand why this wouldn't come with a manual, but geez. I mean, really, the only thing to do is to cut these. These are, these have never, these are sticking way up, these pins. 
from the uh, connector. And really, I don't know how you would, you know. Um, yeah, it's working. All right, well, let me take a pair of snips to the, I'd say the two on this side and the two on that side, and then I'll put a piece of electrical tape. Um, well, shoot, I'll put the electrical tape on here because... That way it'll ensure I'm lined up, and uh, the idea is to, yeah, I mean, so if you push down on the keyboard, you don't want it making contact with the pins, so the pins should be cut and possibly also filed to make sure that they don't have too much of a sharp edge, but that's going to be a pain because then you're worried about the filings getting into the Amiga. Oh, brother. Those of you who think they might know the solution I assure you this thing is pushed all the way down maybe some of these I'm, I'm suspecting that if you haven't had this problem my particular unit came with uh, extensions you know um, which is required but maybe my extensions aren't quite as are, are a little bit higher than the ones on yours or whatever but I mean this isn't too bad of a fix too difficult of a fix here. We're certainly not doing any damage to anything. Simply by cutting our excess pins off. Alright, so the bottom four are cut off now. And I think rather than do some electrical tape, so we technically probably have enough room here, but if somebody pushes down on this, pretty sure it's yeah, I can hear it. I can feel it making contact. So, uh, we need a spacer. We need to put a spacer in there. So, uh, I might cut a few more pins so that I can get something that I can put in there. Um, let me see what I've got. I've just got some scrap ABS plastic. I'll find something that's just the right size. And in fact, I'm going to cut two more pins off of here. Because they are really close. But if you slam down on the keyboard hard enough, I can totally see you hitting the, um, you know, making a short on that. But it really, really doesn't look like it's a problem anymore. Just to be safer than safe, I'm going to cut a bit more and then I'm going to glue or otherwise probably hot melt glue, you know, a piece of plastic across there just to make sure that even if you slam down on it, it won't make contact. Going against what I was thinking before or what I had told you my policy was I actually super glued a piece of plastic down here. This is something that you'd never, never want to be without when using this in an Amiga 500. And uh, I, I can only assume that the risers can vary, their, their, their height can vary, and I happened to get, or Brad happened to get one that was really high. So we've got that in there. It's, it's higher than the pins that I've cut off. And so it'll keep it from And we'll keep it from doing bad things. I'm going to need to shave this down a little bit. I have a beveled edge. I happen to find a piece of plastic with a beveled edge on the bottom, but it's not beveled enough. I mean, we're talking millimeters of difference here. So I'm not real happy with... I don't want this to push down. It's only pushing down a little bit, but, you know... I mean, we, we need this protection here. We absolutely need this protection here. Um, I'm just going to take a file and, 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 and file the edge off of this so that it's, the keyboard sits down a little, a little easier. Now, I'm not touching the pins because, again, this thing sits higher than the pins by design. It sits higher than the pins 
it's protecting. I think that might do it. Yeah, I think so, because it's hitting here. It's still, it's that stupid s screw here, you know. Um, Oh, and actually, I think I've had this happen once before where the actual, you know what? This is the problem. This thing is just slightly bent. I'm wondering why I never encountered that before. But I have encountered keyboards that have a bend to them before. I don't know how that happens, but, you know. The solution isn't that difficult. You just have to be careful. Because you got to remember there's a circuit board behind here. It's just actually on this end here. That might be why it's, I'm having a little bit of trouble with the, ter the terrible fire, but but we're talking about a millimeter of deflection, so we were we were very shorted to the to the terrible fire accelerator. It was it wasn't a close thing. It was definitely something that you know I, I don't know how anybody else hasn't had that problem. Look at that. That's much better. Well, a little bit better. It's still a little wobbly on that screw, but at least we don't have as much tension on it. Okay. And, all right. Yeah, we should be good. I'll probably time lapse this part because it takes a while to boot off his his compact flash. Some kind of double booting thing going on here. Not sure why. Yeah, see there it went again. Well, he does that on his compact flash card. His adapter seems to work except for the LED. So now it's actually booting off the hard drive, and because it's a some sort of elaborate version of Workbench 3.1. It's take, taking longer anyway. I don't know why I'm not seeing the um, the CLI window. You know, as it boot, it's it's booting up, but I'm not too concerned about it because it's working. So we're good here. Um, let me just try an experiment. It's still loading, but let me just try an experiment. If we switch it over to 1.3, we should get uh, you know. Okay. All right, so Workbench 1.3 is simply not supported by, by that. Uh, I mean, you can boot off of a hard drive with Workbench 1.3, but um, and I got to think here for a second. I've done so many of these and I haven't done any recently. The accelerator or its hard drive controller could just be completely not compatible with 1.3. But it seems like with 1.3, I mean, this came up right away. It didn't even try. So I think this accelerator is the part that doesn't actually, um, you know, the actual doesn't support 1.3. Or is it 1.3 doesn't work with 030 accelerators? Is that what it is? And then it just does this. It just completely ignores them. I mean, there isn't a 68,000 processor in here. So that means that the O30 processor is working because we're seeing something on the screen. It's just the hard drive controller. That must be it. So how's that logic for you? Huh? All right. So we know that this works. Um, we know the other works. And so the only thing we need, we need to do is 
maybe test out a game. Yeah, that was a hard drive, by the way. I'm pretty sure that's what that was about. So anyway, I don't have any sound hooked up. That's a problem. This isn't blackout, this is blockout. I can't read my own writing. Okay, well, I guess we're done with Brad's Amiga, so I appreciate you joining me for this journey, and uh, we'll see you soon. Thanks.